Okay, folks, final stretch for the day. Have you been blessed today? Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to see you here. Thank you for taking a whole week of time to come and be at uh, Secrets Unsealed Studio uh, to study uh, this very important subject on the meaning of the Hebrew feasts. Probably I should have given it a different name uh, than the Hebrew feasts because, uh, you know, we got at least one phone call saying, why uh, are you studying the Hebrew feasts? When are you going to study the Christian feasts? Well, the fact is that these are the Christian feasts. The only thing is they were given to the Hebrews. Like salvation is of the Jews, it says there uh, in the book of Romans. So anyway, it doesn't mean that, that the Jews save us. What it means is that God gave all of the plan of salvation in figures and shadows and illustrations and types to the Jews. But everything is fulfilled in the Messiah. Let's go on our syllabus to page 161. And let me just say where we're going to be going in the next several sessions. We have this session this afternoon, and then we have Friday and Sabbath. We have five on Friday and basically two on Sabbath because the worship service is a different subject. So I've had to sit down and recalibrate how much we're able to cover. So basically, we're going to deal with the Day of Atonement in this particular lecture and in the first one tomorrow. And then we're going to deal with the Feast of Tabernacles next, and I'm hoping to do that in one. Then we're going to deal with the Feast of Dedication, the season of Christ's birth. And then we'll deal with Colossians chapter 2, uh, which speaks about the law that was nailed to the cross, let no one judge you on feast days and new moons and Sabbaths, etc. Then we'll dedicate two presentations to whether we should keep the feasts or not, whether we're required to keep the feasts. And then finally, the last one, will be on the lunisolar Sabbath, the so-called lunisolar Sabbath. So uh, that means that we're not going to be able to cover everything in the syllabus. There's a whole long section on uh, the scapegoat, Azazel. And uh, that's kind of deceptive advertising because really it deals with the entire sanctuary, uh, including the daily service, the yearly service, and the fin final disposal of sin on the scapegoat. So you're going to want to read uh, those, uh, I think it's two or three chapters on, uh, on the scapegoat Azazel because it deals with all of the sequence of events in the sanctuary. So let's go to page 161, the Day of Atonement. Now uh, in Daniel 8, 14 and Leviticus 23, we have the date for the beginning of the Day of Atonement. What is the date? It is the 10th day of the 7th month, what year? 1844. And uh, so the judgment, the Day of Atonement would begin October 22, 1844. And we get the date from Leviticus 23, there we get the month and the day, and from Daniel 8, 14, connected with Daniel 9, we get the year, 1844. So that's the first point that you have here. The date comes from Daniel 8.14 connected with Daniel 9.25 and the month and the day come from Leviticus 23, 26, and 27. The heavenly description of the event that begins on that date is given in Daniel chapter 7. And that's the passage that we're going to especially look at with a fine-toothed comb this afternoon. So the heavenly event that occurs on that date is described in Daniel 7. And then the earthly announcement of that event is found in Revelation 10 and Revelation 14, 6, and 7. So we have the date, we have the heavenly event, and we have the earthly announcement found in Scripture. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 7. And I'm not going to dwell on all of the details that we find in Daniel 7. Um, the last series that I did was called God's Great Prophetic Chain, where I studied in detail the prophecy of Daniel 7, uh, connected with Revelation 13, uh, and also some details with Revelation chapter 17. So we're not going to repeat, this, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, in other words. 
But uh, we need to look at the sequence of powers here. So in Daniel 7, we have a lion. What kingdom is represented by the lion? It is the kingdom of Babylon. And what are the dates? 605 to 539 B.C. Then the next beast in Daniel 7 is a bear. And the bear represents which nation? It represents the combined powers of the Medes and the Persians. And that kingdom lasts from 539 to 331 B.C. Then we have a leopard. The leopard represents the kingdom of Greece. And Greece ruled from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Then after that, you have a dragon beast. It's not called a dragon in Daniel 7, but all the description is of a dragon. Revelation 12, this power is called a dragon. So it's legitimate to call the fourth beast a dragon, because Revelation calls it uh, in that way. So you have a dragon beast. And what does this dragon beast represent? The dragon beast represents the Roman Empire, the United Roman Empire. And of course, the, Ro the United Roman Empire rules from 168 B.C., all the way to 476 A.D., when the last Roman emperor was deposed. His name was Romulus Augustulus. He was deposed in 476 and leaves the throne vacant so that the bishop of Rome can occupy the vacated Rome, uh, Roman throne that was vacated by Romulus Augustulus. And then you have the ten horns. The ten horns are the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. And I'm not going to mention them by name. You know, in evangelism, uh, this is something that is always covered. Uh, you know, the Astragos and the, uh, the Heroli and the Vandals. And uh, you have the Anglo-Saxons, the Alemanni, the Suevi, uh, the Lombards, etc. You know, there's, there's ten of them. But of those ten kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was divided, three of them were what? Were uprooted by the little horn. And uh, were those three horns uprooted between 476 and 538? Yes. What was the first kingdom that was uprooted? The Heruli. In what date? 493 A.D. The next kingdom of the ten that was uprooted was the kingdom of the Vandals. And they were uprooted in the year 534 A.D. The final of the ten kingdoms that was uprooted, the third that was uprooted, is the kingdom of the Ostrogoths. And the Ostrogoths suffered a devastating defeat in the year 538 in Rome, and they never recovered. Basically, they disappeared from history. So between 476 and 538, the little horn, the papacy, by the help of the Roman emperors, uproots three of these ten kingdoms into which the Roman Empire was divided. And then in the year 538, the papacy begins its period of rule in 538. And how long was the papacy going to rule? How long was the papacy going to sit on the throne? It was going to be on the throne for 1,260 days. But days in prophecy represent years. So the papacy was going to reign on the throne of Caesar, so to speak, in Rome, till 1798. Of course, the 1260 years go from 538 to 1798. So we have moved in history from the year 605 BC all the way till the year 1798. Now, what is the next event in Daniel 7? We've uh, basically followed the prophetic chain, right? Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire divides, three horns are uprooted, then the papacy rules from 538 to 1798. We've had no interruptions, we've had no gaps, no parentheses. History has flowed one event right after another event. Immediately after, 
the papacy receives its deadly wound, the next scene is a judgment scene. So the question is, when does the judgment begin? Does the judgment begin in the days of the Apostle Paul? No. Does the judgment begin during the period of papal supremacy? No. When must the judgment begin? It must begin sometime after 1798 because it's the very next event that we find in Daniel chapter 7. Now we're going to find, I'm just going to summarize now and then we're going to look at the verses. We find that this judgment that takes place in heaven transpires in three successive steps. By the way, this judgment is the Day of Atonement, right? We're dealing with what happens after 1798, the judgment of Daniel 7, is the description, the heavenly description of the Day of Atonement. And that's what we're dealing with now, the Day of Atonement. Now, uh, there are three successive stages to this judgment, and they're very clear in the passage that we're going to take a look at. They follow the same pattern as jurisprudence in California and in the United States. What are the three stages of the judgment? First of all, you have the investigative stage, the examination of the evidence. Do trials today go through that stage first? Sure. If somebody is accused, what happens? You have the district attorney present the case against, and you have the defense attorney present the case in favor of the person who is accused. And you have an examination of all of the evidence of the case. So the first stage of the heavenly judgment is the examination stage or the investigative stage. The second stage of the judgment is the verdict or the sentence. And the verdict or the sentence is based on what was revealed by the evidence, right? Is that our system of jurisprudence? Do we have a sentencing stage? Yes, we have a sentencing stage. And then the last stage of the judgment is the execution of the verdict, the execution of the state uh, uh, of the um, of the um, the execution of the sentence that has been given, either in favor or against the individual that has been on trial. So we have three stages. Stage number one, the examination or investigation. Stage number two, the sentence or the verdict. Stage number three, the implementation of the sentence or the verdict. Where did we get that system of jurisprudence from? We got it from the Lord. Amen. We got it from the Bible because that's the method that we use on earth, the same method that God uses in heaven. Now going to the next page, you have a summary at the top of the page. This is page 162. You have the investigative stage in heaven. You have the sentencing in heaven. And you have the rewarding where? On earth. Don't forget this. When it comes to the Day of Atonement, when it comes to the judgment in 1844 that begins in 1844, the first two stages of the judgment take place in heaven. And the final stage takes place on earth. In other words, the examination takes place in heaven. The sentencing takes place in heaven. And the rewarding takes place on earth. Now, we need to answer some questions before we examine this passage that we find in Daniel chapter 7 where the judgment is described. First of all, who is the center of focus of this judgment? Is the center of focus the little horn or is the center of focus the saints? That's one question that we're going to try to answer. Who is at the center of focus? Is it the work of the little horn and the judgment of the little horn? Or is the central focus the reward that is given to the saints of the Most High? The second question we want to answer is, is this judgment limited 
to those who lived during the 1260 years. Because the context is dealing with the persecution of the little horn against the saints of the Most High. So the assumption is made because this is dealing with the persecutions against God's people during the 1260 years, this judgment, what it does is it rectifies the wrong judgments that were made on earth by the little horn. So it's restricted only to what happened during the 1260 years. But the question is, is there a broader significance to the judgment of Daniel 7, where even though Daniel 7 is referring to the 1260 years of persecution, there really is a broader understanding of this. There is a broader understanding. There's an illustration here in uh, your syllabus, and uh, it's the next bullet point. The example of the Sabbath in Exodus 31, and then another example is the millennial judgment. And so let's take those two examples to show that just because Daniel 7 is talking about, about the little horn and the persecution of God's people during the 1260 years doesn't mean that this judgment only involves them. Are you understanding my point? It's broader than that. Take, for example, Exodus 31. In Exodus 31, verses 12 through 18, God says that He gave the Sabbath to Israel. Let's read that. Uh, let's read a couple of verses there. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. And let's notice just a, a couple of verses there. And of course, non-Adventists will use this and they'll say, see, the Sabbath was for the Jews. It says there in Exodus 31, and let's read verses 16 and 17. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day He rested, and He was refreshed. So what is the argument that is used? The argument that is used is, it says clear as day, that the Sabbath is a sign between God and the children of Israel. So it's not a sign between God and us. Is that a correct assumption? No. Is that the right conclusion? No. That because it was a sign between God and Israel, it's not a sign between God and us. That's a false assumption. That's an illogical assumption. Why in Exodus 31 does God say that this, the Sabbath, was a sign between Him and Israel? Because Israel was His people. Hello, at that moment. He wasn't going to say, the Sabbath is between me and the church. Because He wasn't dealing with the church at that stage. He was dealing with Israel. But just because he gave it as a sign between him, him and Israel doesn't mean that there's not a broader perspective that applies to those who are not members of the children of Israel. Are you with me or not? So just to restrict it to Israel is a mistake, even though it says it's for the children of Israel. Another example of this is found in Revelation chapter 20. If you go with me there. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 20, it's speaking about a group that is going to resurrect at the second coming. And uh, God has a special function for them. He has a special job for them to do during the thousand years. Notice Revelation 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. So there's this group. This group sits on thrones, and what task is given to them? They have, they're given the task to what? To judge. Judgment is committed. This is not a, a judgment in favor of them. It is a work of judgment for them to perform. So it says here, uh, and judgment was committed to them. Now, who is this group that sits on throne and judges? Who do you suppose they're judging? Are they judging the righteous? No, because during the millennium, the righteous are already in heaven, right? Are they judging the righteous angels? No, because the righteous angels don't need any judgment. So, so this is speaking about a millennial judgment 
where these individuals are going to perform a work of judgment. Now the question is, when did they live? Notice what we find here in the last half of the verse. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Also, so this group of individuals who is given the work of judgment, what happened to them? They were what? They were beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Now the question is, when were they beheaded for this? Notice the last part of the verse. Who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So when did these people live, the ones that were beheaded? What period of history did they live? They lived during the trial of the beast, right? During the trial of the image of the beast, right? During the period when the mark of the beast was imposed, correct? That's what the verse says. Can this apply to the saints of the Middle Ages? No. You say, why not? For the simple reason, there was no image to the beast during the, during the 1260 years. And there was no mark of the beast either. Because the mark of the beast is imposed at the very end of time. Are you following me or not? To those, who, to those individuals who know the Sabbath is the day they're supposed to keep, but they insist on keeping Sunday anyway. So let me ask you, this group that is given the task of judgment, when do they live? They live immediately before the close of probation, during what is called the little time of trouble. Will there be martyrs during the little time of trouble? When the Sunday law is being agitated, will there be individuals sentenced to death? This says yes. There are people who do not worship the beast or his image or receive the mark that will be beheaded, it says here. So who are the ones that are going to perform this work of judgment during the thousand years? Those who lived at the very end of time. And they are the only ones. Huh? It says here that judgment was committed to this group. So nobody else can do it other than this group, right? Wrong. There's a broader perspective when you go to other Bible verses. Let me ask you, is it legitimate to go from uh, Daniel chapter 7 to Leviticus 16, the chapter that speaks about the Day of Atonement? Is that a broader view that much more than the saints during the 1260 years are going to be judged? Absolutely. The focus of Daniel 7 is the 1260 years, but Leviticus 16 broadens it and it says not only that group is going to be judged, but everyone who professed the name of Jesus is going to be judged. You have to go to the rest of Scripture. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to show you that judgment is going to be committed not only to those who live at the very end of time, but the Apostle Paul and the Corinthians are going to be sitting on thrones judging too. Now that's not in Revelation 20 verse 4, but it's in 1 Corinthians 6. So is there a broader perspective to Revelation 20 verse 4? Absolutely. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? What does this mean? The world? Who is the world here? Are they the righteous or the wicked? The wicked. The wicked. But not only that, it says, and listen carefully, and if the world will be judged by you, says Paul, are the Corinthians going to be participating in that judgment of the world? I thought it was only who, those who didn't worship the beast or his image or receive the mark. If you stay just in Revelation 20 verse 4, you would have to restrict it, but it's broader. Let me ask you, are there texts in the Bible that show that the Sabbath is for more than the Jews? Absolutely. So you see, don't just stay, don't let people stay in Exodus 31 because you're sunk. You say, yes, yes, it was a sign between God and Israel, but it was not exclusively a sign between God and Israel because other parts of the Bible says that it's for all humanity. My house shall be a ho called a house of prayer for all nations 
And it's speaking about the Sabbath there in Isaiah 56. So notice that he says, And if the world will be judged by you, the Corinthians, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Let me ask you, are the Corinthians and Paul going to participate in that millennial judgment? Are they going to be commi committed to judge as well? But that's not what Revelation 20 verse 4 says. Do you know why? Because Revelation 20 verse 4, the focus is the end time. So why include other, other aspects if the focus is the end time? In Daniel chapter 7, the focus is the little horn and what it did to the saints. So that's the focus. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have a broader view. Are you following me or not? You'll find this objection all the time. Oh, no, but Daniel 7, that's just a judgment of that little segment. It has nothing to do with Leviticus chapter 16. It most certainly does. Leviticus 16 gives you the broader view. Now, I want you to notice that Daniel 7, we're back at the syllabus now, Daniel 7 has four repetitive cycles. I'm sure that you're aware that Bible prophecy is not always written in chronological sequence. The book of Revelation and the book of Daniel are very tricky books. They require careful, meticulous study, not only with regards to what the symbols represent, but the way in which they are structured. The book of Daniel is structured in cycles. And Revelation, even more, Revelation is an extremely complex book. You say, well, why does God make it so complex? Because, because God doesn't want His Word to be like reading Time magazine. Superficial. You read it once and you got it all. He wants us to dig. He wants us to study the Scripture. He wants us to tax our brain to the utmost. Amen. That's why we're here. God wants us to, to, to investigate, to study, to solve what Ellen White calls the deep problems of Scripture. And when we study them, they're not problems anymore. There are four repetitive cycles in Daniel chapter 7 that repeat the same material again and again and again. The first cycle is found in Daniel 7, 9 and 10. The judgment is mentioned. Then in Daniel 7, 17 and 18, the judgment is mentioned again. It's not another judgment, it's the same judgment, but more details are going to be given. Then the judgment comes to view again in verses 21 and 22. And finally, the judgment comes to view again in verses 26 and 27. So if you think that you're going to read Daniel 7, you say, I want to know the chronological sequence of events. Uh, and so I'm going to start at verse 1. I'm going to go all the way to verse 27. You, you, you're not going to be able to make sense out of it because, because the, the chapter itself has repetitive cycles. And if you can discover where the repetitive cycle is, you'll be able to decipher the meaning of the chapter. Are you with me? So it's like the work of, the, of a detective. You know, if I had not been a pastor, I probably would have been a lawyer or a detective. <laughs> because I love looking for clues and digging here, trying to relate this piece to the other piece. But I'm glad that the Lord called me to be a pastor instead of being a detective. Amen. Yeah, amen. Amen. <laughs> So let's go to Daniel 7 and examine these repetitive cycles. Remember that the context is the papacy has ruled 1,260 years till 1798. So what's going to happen now is after 1798. Verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place. Were the thrones there before? Were the thrones there before? No, they weren't there before. By the way, who do you think would be sitting on thrones, plural? Not throne, thrones. Where else in the Bible do you find thrones? In what chapter of the Bible do you find thrones? A throne and thrones. Revelation chapter 4. Who's sitting on the thrones in Revelation chapter 4? The 24 elders. And who are the 24 elders? They're the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. 
That is the heavenly jury. In other words, the thrones are the thrones for the heavenly jury that is going to watch the proceedings and is going to finally give a verdict along with Christ. So it says, I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Where is this taking place? Is this taking place on earth or in heaven? In heaven. Where does the Ancient of Days live? He lives in heaven. Our Father which art in heaven, we pray. So these thrones are placed in heaven. The Ancient of Days was seated. Here's my question. If the Ancient of Days was seated, was he seated there before? Was he seated in that place before? No. The thrones are placed and the Ancient of Days, what? Sits. So he must not have been sitting there before. Continues. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne, now you notice that's singular, right? There's thrones and there is throne. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Who are the wheels? We studied this, the angels, that's right. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Where? In heaven. These are the angels. So where is this taking place? It's taking place in heaven, that's right. And now notice what it says. The court was seated. Where? In heaven. The court was seated and the books were opened. What's going to happen now? There's going to be the investigation of the evidence. The examination of the evidence. Where is this happening? In heaven, very important, in heaven. So where does this judgment transpire? It doesn't transpire on earth at all. It transpires in heaven. And then you'll notice in verse 13, we're not reading all the verses in between because the purpose of, of this is not to help us understand all of Daniel 7. The purpose is for us to understand the, the day of atonement or the investigative judgment. It says in verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who would that be? Jesus. Jesus. Very well. Coming with the clouds of heaven. Who are the clouds of heaven? The with the angels. And where does he come to? He came to the Ancient of Days. Where? Yes. In heaven. Was the Ancient of Days seated in heaven? Were the books opened in heaven? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it says, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him, who is they there? The angels. They brought him near before him. Who is the him? Before the Father. Now the question is, what did he go there for? What did Jesus go to the Father for in heaven when the books are open? Notice verse 14. Then to him, to whom? To Jesus was given. Who gave it to him? The Father. the Father, yes. So now we know why Jesus is going there. It says, then to him was given, is this happening in heaven still? Yes. yes. Dominion and glory and a what? And a kingdom. So what does Jesus go to the Father for in heaven? To receive the what? The to receive the kingdom. So we need to know what the kingdom is. If Jesus goes in for the Father to give him the kingdom, we need to find out what the kingdom is. Well, let's continue reading. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom, the one that sh which shall not be what? Destroyed. So Jesus goes in heaven to where the Father went and the purpose is to receive the kingdom. Now we need to stop there before we look at the other cycles and ask the question, what is Christ's kingdom? You know, we usually think of the kingdom as 
uh, a geographical realm. We usually think of the kingdom as, as a, you know, a territory. But the kingdom of Jesus is not the territory. The kingdom of Jesus are the individuals that belong to him, that belong to his kingdom. The kingdom is composed of the people that are true followers of Jesus. Now, does the church have only individuals that truly have accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord? Do we have in the church wheat and tares? Sure. Do the tares look like the wheat during most of the time? Yeah. Do we have in the church wise and foolish virgins? Are the foolish virgins finally lost? Yeah, they're lost. Do we have in the church good and bad fish? Yes. The gospel net gathers all sorts of fish. Do we have in the church people who have Christ's garment of righteousness and those who are in the church who don't? Yes. Do we have individuals who cry out, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform miracles in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? Where Jesus is going to say, yeah, you did it in my name. You claim to be Christians, but I don't know you. Is that going to happen? Yeah. Are there individuals who have the form of godliness, but don't have the power of godliness in the church? Yes. So the church is composed of true and counterfeit believers. So how do you determine who are the true ones and who are the counterfeit ones? It demands a work of judgment. Examination, right? Mm -hmm. To see who's who. That's the purpose of the judgment. The records are open with the purpose of revealing who was truly a follower of Jesus. Who truly was sorry for sin. Who truly confessed sin, not admitted sin, but confessed sin. Who truly trusted in Jesus as Savior and Lord. And of course, uh, what reveals that is the life of the person. Isn't that right? The life of the person reveals if the person truly has embraced Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So what needs to happen for, Jesus, for the kingdom of Jesus to be complete? There has to be an investigation in the judgment to reveal who are members of his kingdom. That's the purpose of this judgment. Of course, the only ones that are going to be found to be of the kingdom are those who lived during the 1260 years. No. Do you know why the focus is there in Daniel chapter 7 of those who lived during the 1260 years? Let me explain. The reason why is because the papacy persecuted the righteous and the righteous died, and the papacy prevailed. Was there justice in that? No. That was a travesty in justice. Does that, does that evil judgment have to be rectified? Yes. yes. And so all of, all of those saints that lived during this period, that's the focus of Daniel 7, because the chain is dealing with that particular segment. Everyone during that period is examined. John Huss, let's take, let's take John Huss as an example. He was burned at the stake for his religious convictions, for being faithful to Jesus. Was there any justice in that? No. no. Does that have to be rectified? Yes. So now the heavenly court will open the records of John Huss and they will be examined. And the heavenly jury is going to say, now wait a minute. <laughs> the judgment that was done on earth was a wrong judgment we need to rectify this judgment and so in heaven a verdict the verdict of the earthly court will be reversed and now a judgment will be given in favor of John Huss are you following me so why is the focus in Daniel 7 
on this particular segment because Daniel 7 describes this period of persecution. Does that mean that other persecuted beings, does that mean that Abel and others who were persecuted don't come into perspective in this judgment if a travesty and justice was done against them? Of course not. Let's not have tunnel vision. See, oh yeah, just this little segment here. No, Leviticus 16 says, all of those who claim the name of Jesus, all of God's people, will come to view in this particular judgment. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White. It's, a, it's on page 163. I'm getting it a little bit ahead. We need to go back to the other repetitive cycles. But notice Ellen White understood this. Uh, you know, I never cease to model that Ellen White, she, she had it all straight. Uh, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately, there are those who say, yeah, but she didn't have a PhD. And I say, praise the Lord that she didn't. <laughs> I have nothing against the PhD. But the Apostle Paul said that knowledge puffs up. There's always danger of, have, of gaining knowledge and thinking that you're smarter than the Holy Spirit. You know, because you're able to quote bunches of scholars and, you know, you're able to, to uh, put a lot of footnotes in your papers. You know, you just, now you're a scholar. Ellen White does not have zillions of footnotes in her books. Her writings were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And I never cease to marvel as I examine her writings how, uh, how deep she is in her understanding of Scripture. It's simply Leaves me with my mouth open, sometimes literally. Here, Ellen White, in early writings, page 280, states, Every case had been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the word investigative I included because that's talking about the investigative judgment, the investigative judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Now listen carefully. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. So when is it that Jesus receives the kingdom? When he's made an atonement for his people and he's blotted out their sins. In other words, when he's cleansed the sanctuary from their sins. And then she explains, the subjects of the kingdom were made up. So what is the kingdom of Jesus? His subjects. How was it revealed who the subjects of his kingdom are? By the investigation of the evidence. So it says, the subjects of the kingdom were made up, the marriage of the Lamb was consummated, and the kingdom and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven was given to Jesus and the heirs of salvation, and Jesus was to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Are you following me? It's not rocket science. It's actually quite simple. Now let's go back to the passage. We need to go to verse 17. Once again, this is another cycle. It says, Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth, but what's going to happen? But the saints of the Most High shall receive what? the kingdom, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. When is it that the saints actually possess the kingdom? Does this happen on heaven or on earth? On earth. On earth. What is possessing the kingdom based on? Why can they possess the kingdom? Because a verdict was given in their favor based on what? On the examination of the evidence. Are you with me or not? And people say, well, but God doesn't need a judgment. God knows everything. Of course God knows everything. But the judgment isn't to inform God. The judgment is for the benefit of the universe. You know, what would you think of a judge? An accused person is brought before the judge. The jury is there. And the judge looks at this individual. He says, guilty. Death by lethal injection. The jury is sitting there saying, wait, wait. Wait a minute. We haven't examined any evidence. How, how, do we know, how do we know that this person is guilty? And the judge says, I know everything. 
that would go over like a lead balloon. The jury would have questions, wouldn't it? Say, hmm, who knows? Pretty arbitrary decision on the part of the judge. So God's not going to leave any loose ends. He's going to show the case of every single person who has ever lived. Every person who claimed Jesus as Savior and Lord. And the heavenly jury is going to, is going to say whether that person should be a member of the kingdom or not. The benefit of the judgment is not for God, because God knows everything. The benefit of the judgment is for those members of the jury who need to know that God acted correctly in every single case. So when do the saints actually receive and possess the kingdom? When Jesus comes to give them the kingdom. But before that, a verdict was given in their favor, and before that, the evidence was examined. Now, let's go to verse 21. This is an, another cycle. Verse 21. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, and prevailing against them, until when? Until the Ancient of Days came. Came to where? According to what we looked at in the first outline, where did the Ancient of Days come? Did he come to the earth, or did he move in heaven? He moved in heaven. So the little horn is persecuting God's people on earth until the Ancient of Days came. And when the Ancient of Days comes, what happens with those saints? It says, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. Are you catching the picture? So the little horn persecutes the saints of the Most High. But the Ancient of Days comes, and what does he do? He rectifies the decisions that were made by the little horn. And so it says, a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And now notice this, very interesting. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. When is that? Let me ask you, is the verdict in favor of the saints given before they actually possess the kingdom in this passage? Absolutely clear. Because it says here, until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. Where is that, where is that judgment in favor made? In heaven. in heaven. Based on what? On the examination of the evidence. And then it says, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. That's when they actually take it over. That's when the verdict is finally implemented. When they actually receive the reward. Based on the verdict, based on the examination. Now let's go to verse 25, the final cycle. He, that is the little horn, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. Do you notice that usually the mention is of the persecution of the saints during the 1260 years by the little horn? A travesty injustice, right? With them. They're mowed down right and left when they're really innocent in the, in the court of God. So there's going to be an appeal. <laughs> and the appeal is going to reverse the judgments that were made by the little horn in earthly courts. And so it says here, but the courts shall be seated. Where? In heaven. In heaven. Of course. The little horn persecutes the saints of the high for 1260 years. It says, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion. Where? Where is the dominion legally taken away? In heaven. To consume and destroy it forever, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. Where? On earth. The saints of the Most High, his kingdom, because ultimately it's the kingdom of Jesus, singular, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Is the passage clear? You don't even have to know Hebrew. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to have a, a, a PhD diploma. It's right there. Clear. Three stages. Two in heaven and the implementation of the verdict on earth. And once again, the reason why 
only the saints of the 1260 years are in view is because the, because the theme that is being dealt with is that period. So why would you have, why would you be including other periods that would kind of distract from the central thought? Doesn't mean that there's not going to be all of those who claimed the name of Jesus, their names are going to come up before the judgment. And so, Daniel chapter 7 is the heavenly description of the Day of Atonement, which is the examination of the records, the pronunciation of the verdict based on the examination of the records, and then when Jesus comes, He will give His reward to everyone according to their works. So you say, well, then we're saved by our works, right? No. We're not saved by faith alone. We are not saved by works alone. We are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by a faith that works. Because a, first, a faith that does not work is not faith. So one of the purposes of the judgment is to reveal before the judgment who, had, who really had faith in Jesus. Who really believed and trusted in Him. And it's shown by the actions of your life, isn't it? And so, Daniel chapter 7 has a clear view of what happened in heaven beginning in 1844. Let me just dramatize in closing what happened in 1844. And I'm dramatizing, I'm not saying that it happened in this exact way, but uh, in a similar way. Of course, God has a book of life. And in the book of life are all of those who have ever claimed the name of Jesus. So in 1844, um, God says, Okay, the judgment sits. Who is the first person to be judged? An angel says, Adam is the first person to be judged. Ellen White says that with, with those who first lived upon the earth. So God says, Adam, present yourself before my judgment seat. Where was Adam in 1844? Who knows? <laughs> Disintegrated. Who knows where the flood took him? <laughs> Disintegrated. So how could Adam appear before the judgment seat of Christ in 1844 first? Because the angel goes to the library and he brings Adam's DVD. <laughs> Are you following me? And so now God puts the, the DVD in the DVD player with a large super HD screen. And you see the entire life of Adam from beginning to end. Well, maybe God is going to speed it up. You know, we will be acting at a, at a faster speed. <laughs> and so now, the life of Adam is shown on the screen. Let me ask you, is there a certain sense in which Adam is appearing before Christ's judgment seat alive? There's a certain sense. He's, obviously, he's dead. And there's, there's nothing of Adam alive in heaven. But the record that is being watched was made while he was alive. And so in a certain sense, he's appearing alive. Are you following me? And so his entire life is examined. All of his sins are there, covered by the blood, because he repented and confessed them and trusted in Jesus. And so when his case is seen before the heavenly court, God says to the jury, what do you think? Can we bring him home or not? The heavenly jury says, yes. We know he's going to be saved because the two atoms are going to meet. <laughs> and so, and so uh, the heavenly jury says, yes, he's a member of Christ's kingdom. He was faithful. He, he sinned, yes, but he repented. And he was sorry. And he claimed Jesus as his Savior and as his Lord. Yes, keep him in. And so the judgment continues with the dead and finally ends with the living. And when the last person is judged, probation closes. 
because all cases are decided for life or for death. When probation closes, Christ's kingdom is complete because the subjects of his kingdom are complete. Is this making sense? See, the Christian world is oblivious to this because they don't understand the sanctuary. They say, oh, Jesus died on the cross, I'm saved. And I can continue living like the devil. I can continue being selfish. I can continue be watching all those evil programs on television. I can waste hours and hours on my iPhone talking a bunch of nonsense. But I'm saved because Jesus died for my sins. Be careful with that. That's presumption. The life of the person shows whether they truly are committed to Jesus Christ or not. And when I say the life, I'm not talking about only about, you know, keeping the Sabbath and not eating pork and returning our tithe. That, that all will, become, will come into the judgment as well. Because if we're not tithing, we're thieves. Hmm. And no thief is, no thief is going to end up in heaven. Have mercy. They'd be trying to dig up the gold and tear off the doors of pearl. God can't take selfish people there. The judgment will show that there were lots of ex-selfish people <laughs> that were saved by the grace and by the power of Christ. And when probation closes, the kingdom of Christ will be made up. And folks, when probation closes, now you're going to have the worst time of trouble that has ever been seen in the history of planet Earth. And God's people will be on Earth. And they will live without an intercessor because the services of the sanctuary have closed. This is the final generation. There's a lot of people that attack last generation theology these days. And the devil will do his utmost to lead these people to fall. But they will not. He will deceive, if possible, the very elect. But it's not possible. God's people will remain faithful to the Lord in the worst period of history of the world. And in this way, they will vindicate the character of God. They will show that it is possible to serve God, not for the loaves and the fishes, but to serve God simply and purely because you love God. Amen. And the whole universe will see that. Amen. And this whole generation will vindicate the character of God before the entire universe. God is calling us to be among that group. May the Lord help us and bless us so that we can prepare a character through the power of God to stand in that great last day.